welcome to episode 64 of the Comic Watcher Show. I'm your host, Matt Meyer. With me, as always, are Nick and Mike, fellow comic watchers at large. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello, and gentlemen. With, woo, hello. With us, we've got a special returning professor emeritus, Mr. Cody White. Cody, welcome back. Founding comic watcher. Hey, woo. thanks for having me. Of course. You know, we couldn't have a big giant uh, to talk about Justice League 39 or... Uh, Count Crowley numbers one through four from Dark Horse without having you here. So, you know, but uh, first, as ever, it's going to be an awesome show. We've got news from Mr. Scoop Johnson. And plus, Cody signs our paycheck, so we got to bring him back every now and then. So, you know, there's that. There's that thing. But, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Paychecks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, from Image. Um, we got some news from uh, Kieran Gillen, Jim Rosignall, and Jeff Stokely. Uh, they got a mini series coming out called Ludocrats um, that looks pretty zany and freaked out. Um, if there was, if Frank Zappa was into comics and did soundtracks like this, this would be it. This would be this book. This looks really crazy, um, and obviously it has to come out on April first is when the first issue is coming out. So it's really cool. Um, that's on the website. Uh, definitely worth a, a check out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, from Titan, um, the Michael Moorcock Library, The Chronicles of Hawk Moon, The History of the Rune Staff by James Cawthorn, Volume 2. Is that a mouthful or what? Um, so basically, this is like 40 years in the making um, that they are finally finishing this stuff. Um, I completely missed the bus on this and had to do some, uh, just some kind of diving in. But the art uh, for this book is really, really gorgeous. Um, something that I'm definitely going to check out. Um, grab volume one, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which started way back in 79 um, with the comics and stretched through 86. Um, but highly recommended. The art in this is really, it's black and white. Um, and this just looks really, really good. Definitely something to pick up and kind of watch out for. That is actually out now, by the way. Excuse me. Um, also on the website, got some first looks and some sneak peeks want to talk about real quick. Oh, God, excuse me. Anyway, um, as far as the sneak peeks coming from Marvel, uh, we got three decent ones. We got Captain Marvel the end and Doctor Strange the end. Um, those are looking pretty good. And also to coincide with the upcoming Avengers video game, we have Avengers and Hulk 1 up as well on the website. Check that out. Um, in big uh, X-Book news, obviously, that's the still the big thing. Um, Marvel has uh, – we just <clears throat> excuse me pulled up the Ariel Olivet Cable 2 variant cover. That's on the site as well. I'll give that a, uh, a check, which is really a really beautiful cover. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's see. And uh, one other thing that's not on the website, but I, I figure that is actually newsworthy, um, especially for our Spawn fans, um, that Jason Sean Alexander is going to be stepping down from Spawn um, after issue 305. That is going to be his last one. He's going to... <clears throat> exactly, Nick. Right? I'm like, no, not now. Crying right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Was like, so great. Yeah. On the inside. Yeah, you know, my contacts <laughs> are slipping. By the way, those aren't tears. It's just really dry here in Virginia. Um, <laughs> but no, he's going to go on and do good things. And obviously, um, the Todd father has. I mean, we're going to trust him with whatever um, artist he's going to bring in for the 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 book that. Um, you know, that has been just giving us so much joy after all these years. So definitely trust in the Todd father. Um, but that's it for regular conventional news. Um, what kids. about the Rob father? Any, well, any, I, was, uh, I was about to say, you know, the Rob father this week. <laughs> yeah, you know, our, our audience demands this week in Leafell. So we're going right. to deliver. We're going to deliver, kids. <clears throat> um. So basically, we're going to start out with like a, a, a cryptic tweet out of absolutely nowhere. Um, it was just kind of like, you know, here's a little secret. Um, I don't care if you like me, never did, type deal. And of course, that opens the floodgates for all the 
terrific uh, trolls uh, to come out of hiding and kind of just, you know, glom on, you know, and I did this time. What? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's stuff like that that makes my job hard to champion the Rob Father to uh, the fine folks at Comic Watch and stuff. Like, you really, dude, you're backing me into a corner really, really, really bad. Um, but, you know, and, and then, you know, we've all seen his uh, his tweets, you know, kind of, and I say this softly, you know, attacking Marvel now and, you know, kind of like we talked about this last week where, you know, oh, it, you know, Marvel was doing the, the kitschy covers and, you know, Image didn't do kitschy covers. And I'm like, I got, I got, I got boxes in the next room full of like die cut and chromium covers from Image. Like, like dude, like, what are we doing? Um, but something that was pretty new um, about an hour or so ago is um, the almighty Alex Ross, uh, praise be, um, uh, posted a picture of uh, one of his original pieces for Supreme, like him or not. Um, and I was like, oh, that's rats. I gave it a like. And of course, um, this, this innocent bystander on, on, on the Twitter uh, tweeted at Rob and was like, hey, are we going to see any new Supreme? And so I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Let me go down this rabbit hole. And he was like, oh, if it's just, you know, not by its creator, which is me in capital letters. And, you know, it's just good. If you see any Supreme, it's just going to be, you know, secondhand garbage, secondhand trash. Why say that? Just say no. Like, just say no. Just say, just, just, just say no. Move on. Go watch the ESPN or something like that. Grab some nachos. Do something. But, why, why? But you know why, why he said people? that. He yeah. got. But you know why he said that. He got swindled out of the rights yeah. for, for Supreme. I mean, just absolutely. Yeah, okay. I was about to ask. Him. No yeah. pun intended. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But <laughs> so I was just. I mean, like, I get yeah, that. Yeah. I get him saying, you know, fuck any new Supreme comic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. I, yeah. It does. It's terrible that he got screwed out of his creations. It absolutely it, it is. It really is. Yeah. I, that sh I don't care who we're talking about. That shouldn't happen to any creator. Right. And just because, you know, Rob is Rob, love him or hate or, or hate him, that doesn't make it any more cool or okay or acceptable that that happened. So, um, you know, Rob, I, you know, we, we, we kid, and we we have a little good heart natured fun from time to time, but we wish we wish Rob nothing but the best in his quest to someday get young blood and whatever else he lost uh, back for him and yeah, for his. Absolutely. So, ooh ha! Yeah. Uh, in regards to the other thing, it's it's quite a relief to know that um, he has the emotional maturity of a fourteen year old. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes for a great follow on on Twitter. Oh, he right? does. Yeah. I mean, that's why we that's why we have this little segment in the dudes is because he's so fun to follow. Yes. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, anything else from the world of news? No, that's about it. Um, okay. Check the Twitter. Check MySpace. Everything is good to go. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, that means it's time to get on to our reviews for the week. And uh, first up from Dark Horse, we've got Mr. Crowley. Bow, bow, bow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Okay, wait a sec. Before we get the stop, stop. Before we get the oh, my order, bad. You gotta stop. Well, no. is my, I'm sorry. This it's, was your it's baby. Different Crowley. It's not the same thing. Oh, gee. Oh. Set me straight. Educate me. God, why do I do this with you people? I don't know. Anyway, no. Um, so this, um, I'm going to start this review out. If you guys don't mind, I'm just going to. Um, this for me was probably um, something that I was loosely following and then um, was kind of gifted. I knew it was coming out, but was gifted the review of issue one. And just completely blew me away as far as being a fan of like that 70s B-roll movie, that Sven Gulli type of horror humor um, and it, it just type of, you know, plot that this book is, you know, every now and then you, you get 
a an indie title that really kind of grabs you and pulls you in that's non-superhero. Obviously, the big two um, were, were spoiled in that we almost kind of come to expect the big the big stories, right? Um, you know, Doomsday Clock takes five years, which is great, and it's going to be a classic, but it took five years, right? Um, but every now and then you get indie titles that I think really hold uh, your attention and age well, you know, just to, for me, you know, Why the Last Man, um, The Helm, I Kill Giants, you know, stuff that may not be on the same realm as, say, like, Infinite Crisis or Doomsday Clock and stuff like that, but really age well, and you just want to read and read and read, and you find yourself wanting more, and that's what Count Crowley is, is you follow Jerry Bartman, and automatically, for me, I, I, I fell in love with her, because it's like this, this fall from grace that she was this uh, successful reporter, um, and you don't know why all of a sudden she's on the bottle, you know, was she always, you know, an alcoholic? Did she always, was she always down and out? Well, no, because that's not what this feels like. Um, when you're reading, especially issue one and two, you, you, there, there's something else. And what David Dasmalchian succeeds in is every page you think you know what's coming and your mind already has, yeah, I got it. That, that was, this is what's going to happen. Well, no, because three quarters way through the book, you're going, oh, son, you son of a gun. Okay, that's not what's going to happen, right? Because raise your hand if you fit, if you thought the cat was going to like morph into something, right? Everyone <laughs> thought that. Everyone thought the cat was going to take on this bigger role. Um, but the cat never did. Exactly, right? Because I was like, oh, the cat's going to morph into something, right? This could be great. But it's just a cat. And that's what, that's just one of the elements that makes this series that much great because you, you got into literally every aspect of the character description. You know, like when <clears throat> um, her brother and her sister-in-law came to bail her out, you know, and, and the, the sister-in-law was berating her. Oh, it's always about you oh, you know, you don't know what your brother's going through keeping the station running and stuff like that. Like, you felt that. Um, and it's just, like, you want more, you know? And the fact that we had to wait, you know, a month. Like, if there was ever a title that I wanted to be on that Marvel Weekly or when, like, you know, DC was doing, like, the, oh, you know, oh, we're going to release something, you know, for the next 52 weeks every week. Why couldn't Count Crowley be this, you know? Why do we have to wait a month for this crap? But in a, in a crap in a good way, David, if you ever watch the show or, you know, Lucas or, you know, Lauren, please trust me. I, I enjoyed the book highly. Anyway, um, but no, I just, it was, it's one of those things that just grabs you, you know. And one of the things that I absolutely enjoyed, the Unsung Heroes, was Lucas Kentner and Lauren Aff um, with the art and the inks it almost makes you wonder if they were like pre-gaming before every issue. Like, okay, this is what David's writing. And then Lucas was like, okay, this is what I'm thinking about drawing. But then Lauren was like, well, you know, are we going to do this? You do, do you want to do that? And it was just between plot, between the writing, the art, um, and the inks, everything was just so gelled perfectly. Um, that makes this such a great non-superhero book. You know, and then the big reveal in issue four, um, <clears throat> I must have read it three times, you know, because I was just like when we, we found out a, uh, that the maybe the vehicle or one of the vehicles of why Jerry's on the bottle um, and, and not to, you know, I don't want to say, it kind of spent out for a while, but not the spoil review, but you almost kind of like, okay, I get it now you know, of why she doesn't trust, why her life is kind of falling apart and why every time something uh, goes wrong, she's always reaching for that, that, that quick, simple answer. Um, but, and also the big review when she was in the AA meeting, um, you know, with the dog and everything, you're just like going, <laughs> you, 
like, like, how does he do this? You know, how does he keep you inclined? And, you know, as I said in my review, um, and for issue four, you know, I really hope this isn't the last time that we see this creative team of, you know, Kettner, Das Malchian, and Aff, because, I mean, it, it was good. It was, it was a fun, non-superhero book that I think is going to age uh, very well. You know, this is definitely one of those books that I would hand to someone um, and, and uh, maybe introduce them to comics, or maybe they're not into superhero comics, um, or if you have someone that's into the old 70s monster illustrated magazines, which this is completely um, in line with, um, this is that book. It was fun. Comics are fun. It was definitely one of those titles that um, comes along in a while and really grabs you, holds your interest for a very long time. And um, it, gentlemen, I mean, let me know, because I've championed this book since issued one on the show. Um, and just uh, all over the internet and discussion groups and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, Matt, um, let, let me know. Ha! Actually, I, I kind of want – Nick is our uh, resident horror guru. I kind of want to hear his thoughts on yeah. it, actually. Yeah, I had listened to Mike champion this book for quite a while, and <laughs> – I didn't, I knew I would like it just because how, just the description of it. I mean, classic B-roll horror, I, I'm here for it, like sign me up. But I, I sat down with issues one through four in one sitting and it's kind of a brisk read, but man, is it awesome. Like it's really, really good classic horror, but it doesn't rely on the typical standard of horror. It it uses uh, Jerry's character development as everything essentially you you care about her her struggle and this dealing with alcoholism while essentially this fallout of her life and you know that is enough to pull you into the story but the the usage of monsters and stuff like that it's a reluctant midnight monster hunter like I I thought that there would be a lot more of that monster hunter aspect so that's kind of what I was jump what I thought that I was jumping into um it was an awesome twist to see that it was much more character driven and comics can so easily fall into baddie punch them up and you know toss horror into it and it's just monsters with the same thing but this is not that type of horror book um it yeah it's humorous and it's a bit more lighthearted sometimes but it uses in-depth character drama i think to to really navigate this world and establish the character while describing the story of her falling out as this reporter and having to take on hosting kind of a cheesy show walking through horror movies and stuff like that i i took it as something like a mystery science theater 3000 that it, someone who's like a host classic horror host i mean let's bring those back while we're at it elvira and stuff like that i got a lot of that yes. vibe and it wasn't something that she sought after so that was the whole template of the humor is, you know, this is kind of a lowly job position. You're just doing this for a paycheck, mm -hmm. but the horror turns out to be real. And I think that's where you get to play with the comics medium. And that's where they did so well with it and, and not going overboard with it, but using horror to its advantage to, to tell this character driven story. And by the end of it, you get this setup where, you know, now she's actually excited to be part of this show. Um, there, there's a role ahead of her. There's a great cast of characters. There's a world of horror to explore and you're kind of just getting going by issue four and you know, that's the end of it. Yeah. So any good comic wants to pull you back for more and I, you know, what else can be said about it? It's, it's great. It's a great example of what comics can be outside of the big two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, Cody, what were your thoughts? Yeah, so mostly I'm in line with everybody else. Like, I thought it was a really fun book. Um, I thought that for Aiden Voyage, and I'm always wary when I see this actor, this director, this producer is going to start writing comics. Like, all right, well, your first go is probably going to be crap because you're not used to this style of storytelling. I mean, you name it. Like, even, you know, Reggie Hudlin, when he took over Black Panther back in the day, it was like... <sighs> The house party guy, like that's the guy. All right, he's gonna take over after uh, that miraculous priest run. Sure, okay. And it was 
all right, do a groove later on. And I kind of was expecting that more with uh, David's Maiden Voyage here. And it really did work out very well. Although I think this should have been a six issue miniseries with the same length story. So that there was a little bit more space for some of the action sequences to breathe. Like the pacing just felt a little bit off. Like it would be a quick hit. We're fighting a werewolf. And then a page later, we're done fighting a werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> like, like give that some some room because it is a really cool scene. Like this is somebody who did not believe in werewolves 30 seconds ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and still is not that she's sober and fighting yeah. this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that she's not just hallucinating it. This isn't just a dog. I mean, it, it could have used some more room, but that's not his fault. Like, I'm sure Dark Horse was like, hmm, Mr. Actor Man, we'll give you yeah. four issues. And and I'm within the confines of those four issues, he did deliver. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I had no idea David Desmelchian was an actor. Someone want to educate He's me? one of the, yeah, he's one of the, the buddies on Ant-Man. Mm-hmm. What? So you know, and and Ant Man, he's got the the three. He's the Russian one. Yeah. Oh crap! I love yeah. that guy. Yeah. <laughs> right. right? That, that's always the response. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Comic Watchers. We're we're good, by the way. We're... <laughs> we definitely know what we're talking we are professionals. About. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, all said and done, he took, he took four issues character that I absolutely do give a shit what happens next. Uh, yeah. And knowing Dark Horse, they will return probably four issues at a time when his schedule allows. Uh, I could see, you know, an art team, uh, which would be a shame, but maybe not. Like, maybe they'll get somebody great. Who knows? Uh, I thought the art was really stole the show in this. Uh, the visual story techniques that... that uh, I forgot the name of the artist. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Lucas Kettner. I literally just read this like 45 minutes ago. And then Warren did the uh, inks. Yeah, I, I thought that they did just an absolutely stellar job all the way through. Like it carried through the right <clears throat> vibes without getting too cheesy. Like it maintained a sense of seriousness about itself while also poking fun at the medium that it's working within. And I thought that was just really well executed. So I don't know. I... I don't know that I'm as high on it as Mike is, but I'd give it a solid like 8.5 out of 10. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. For somebody's maiden voyage, that's pretty. That's pretty dang good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah you know, I I read this, and I'll be honest, I my, the contrarian in me was looking for any reason to be able to have a a a, a friendly dis- debate over the merits of this comic, just because Mike's been so high on it for so long. <laughs> ah, I'm going to be able to have some back and forth with him. Right? No, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> Mike, you totally called it. Uh, I loved this comic. I mean, just from the first issue, I was completely pulled into it. And the thing that got me uh, was just how completely this world was built, almost from the start first page it everything in here just feels natural and organic and that I, I you get you're right you get to the end of issue four it ends on a massive cliffhanger you know huge 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 to be continued and i'm just like wait a minute why did this happen what why is this an ongoing <coughs> excuse me and um you know it if this was an ongoing, I'd absolutely buy this comic on a regular basis. No question about it. Um, it it's, you know, I my qualms on it were kind of the same thing you said, Nick. It, it does read a little fast. Mm. Uh, and, and I think, Cody, that's probably, you know, I think you're probably right. Maybe it should have been five or six issues. But, you know, all things taken equally, given what we got with it, it's just a minor miracle of a comic that that it comes together as well as it does with as strong of a voice uh, and a, and perspective and hugely strong characterization. Um, it, yeah, it it in a very in an odd way, it reminds me is has kind of a. Uh, uh, a, a, a cousin or offspring of sorts of Buffy. And, Ooh. you know, I 
personally can't get much higher in my in my praise than comparing anything at all to Bucky. So um, yeah, David Desmalchian, Lucas Kettner, um, Affy, uh, Jordan, Jordan, Affy. Jordan. Okay, uh, yeah, th- these are just immensely talented people. Had of course the fact that now I know, and I guess we all know that David Desmalchian <laughs> is in fact an actor, and he has a day job means uh, we probably won't get a. Uh, a monthly anytime soon, but man, I whenever this whenever this thing does return, I am all in. And I gotta say, speaking to his acting, I'm not sure just because of the makeup, but if you get on your channel, they have trailers for uh, each issue that comes out, and they are magnificent. They're hilarious. Yeah. It's kind of the show that Jerry is taking over, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. It's really, really cool and just, you know, it's kind of offbeat humor or somewhat slapstick, but it there are two minute videos that you really should check out. They're hilarious. Yeah. And every, and when he was doing, <clears throat> excuse me, when he was doing uh, appearances, he was dressing as the ghoul um, in like the YouTube videos. And he was also having uh, Count Crowley or Jerry uh, uh, with him with his appearances. So you were not only getting David Dasmalchian, but you were getting Jerry Bartman as well. So they, I mean, every, everywhere he went to be at a con, be at a, a, a bookstore, a signing, wherever he was, you know, comic shop. Um, it was definitely count Crowley full to the max and stuff like that. So it's, it's the, the videos are great. I mean, it's definitely every, every aspect of this book is, is worthy of uh, checking out. Most definitely. Um, guys, any final thoughts on Count Crowley, Reluctant Midnight Monster Hunter? Or have we said it all? I think we said it all. Okay. Well, that being said, we've got a lot more to say about uh, Justice League number 39, the final issue written by Scott Snyder, art by Jorge Jimenez, Daniel Sampier, and Juan Albaran. Uh, this is it. Everything in uh, Snyder's run has built up to this. It's the finale of the Justice Doom War. Um, if you've been living under a rock, you you might not know what has been going on. But um, in a very, very, very tiny nutshell, the uh, primordial goddess Perpetua has ridden and she is throwing the cosmos into the throes of doom. Doom basically being... Uh, that you give in to your own worst negative impulses because, hey, why not? It feels right. And uh, forces of justice have been fighting against this. Um, she's got Lex Luth and amped up Lex Luthor on her side. She's got uh, the anti-monitor. Um, God. And then at the end of the last issue, just when things seemed darkest, we had a return from the dead of the Martian Manhunter, which is exactly where the issue picks up. Um, the tide is about to turn, and Cody White, go. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I've been I've been reviewing Justice League for quite some time. Uh, I think it's been like a year now, if you can believe that. <clears throat> it's been quite a while. And I've never fully been sold on the direction that this was heading really until probably this issue. Now this issue is not without flaws. The last couple of pages of this issue seem like there should be a couple more. Uh, When I first got the advanced reader, I had to go back and double check. Like they didn't say the end or to be continued or nothing. Like they just, they walk through a door, the end it's over. There's no more page after that. And I mean, that kind of threw me for a loop. I read it probably six times. I thought about it for hours. Uh, I walked through the grocery store. I went to the grocery store to buy cat litter. I didn't buy cat litter. I I came home, realized I hadn't bought cat litter and immediately took to Twitter because it's obviously Chip Zdarsky's fault. Screw you, Chip Zdarsky. Everything's your fault. Um, This issue has so much happening in it. And at the same time, nothing happening in it. Like the finale is they lose. That Martian Manager comes back. I'm going to spoil it. Everybody's already read it clearly according to the internet or they're just not going to read it anyway. Um, 
they lose. Martian Manor comes back. He appeals to humanity. He says, you know, we're your heroes. We're here. We're, believe in yourselves. Don't, don't be selfish assholes. Like, let's rise up and put justice back where it belongs. And humanity sees that and they hear it. And they go, nah, we're going to vote for the other guy. Like, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and go this path. And then, we, and Bruce even says, like explicitly, we lost the vote. And I think that there's something telling there in this. Uh, you know, I always try to ask myself, like, why are they telling this story? What is this story saying at this point in time? Because comics are always such a social animal, right? They're always latching on to national and global discourses and trying to relay that and push something out of it, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And with this one, I felt like this was a distinct political message. Like we're in an election year. There's no accident that they're talking about voting. And you've got the one evil over here that people are looking at and saying, you know, yeah, it's evil, but it's, I don't know. It's an evil that's all right for me. And then you've got these emotional characters, right? Like, Diana is love and Cal is hope and Barry is hope. You've got these really emotional characters and there's a flurry of them appealing to your logic and your emotions and you still lose the vote. Now I may not be, not to be overly political, but I mean, if that's not the Democrats versus the Republicans currently in our world, and I mean, Snyder stepping back and saying, look, man, we tried our best, but the Republicans are going to win in 2020. Like that's what, that was the message that I felt like was coming out of this. Like this isn't resignation. This is, well, shit, we tried now burn it and let's go try something else. And then at the, <laughs> at the end, you've got them moving on into what appears to be a whole nother dimension, right? Like this is, this reads soft reboot all over it. So my, my guess as to where this is going is that they are transitioning through this oddly azure door, right? Doomsday clock, we just talked a shitload about it. Uh, through the blue door into the post-Doomsday clock DC universe. Uh, at the end of Doomsday clock, Dr. Manhattan resets everything, reboots it, but doesn't really change that much, just the little things that he messed with. So I think that's where we're going with this, that the Justice League is now transitioning out of this world that y'all ruined. <laughs> y'all voted evil into office, so you can have it. We're going to go over here and hang out with uh, the Legion and the JSA. So, I mean, that was that was kind of my, my read on it, because it is a very vague, very oddly constructed issue. Uh, but I'm, I loved it. Like, I enjoyed every second of it. Like, I, lo I like to see the good guys lose sometimes. Uh, especially, I would rather see them lose in comics than in real life. So, so it's, it's enjoyable to kind of see it just didn't work out, man. And maybe that's, you know, Snyder saying for his whole run. Like, I mean, this thing started in Dark Knight's Metal with... Uh, a dragon and the world forger and a dark multiverse and has carried through, you know, we broke the fourth wall or the source wall in no justice. And now for like two and a half years, we've been following along waiting for something to resolve. And in the end, nothing resolved. And that's bold. Like that's ballsy. So I guess now we have the uh, chainsaw of truth to look forward to, and uh, we'll we'll find out a little bit more about what that's all about as uh, as time goes on. But it'll be Snyder and Capullo's uh, swan song, I guess, because I I don't think they're coming back to DC once this is all over. I'd be real surprised, but but yeah, uh, I've blathered on long enough. I mean, I just. I'm fascinated by everything that Snyder's done here throughout this run, whether I've enjoyed it all the way through or not is another question, but just the, the absolute gumption it takes to take on a project like this with such decompressed storytelling and see it through to, 
an ending of sorts. Like it's, he took a lot of risks here. He really did. He took a lot of risks, uh, could have burned a lot of bridges. I know he lost a lot of fans along the way. And I mean, then that's just, those are the breaks, man. Uh, but nothing but respect for taking a gamble and trying to sincerely impact the medium at a time when DC could really use it. Let's be honest. DC needs some shakeup. And uh, Snyder was the guy that, you know, trying the hardest. So. Uh, I don't. Remember, I don't know how this goes anymore. I'm <laughs> ah, fucker. You're out of the loop. No, it's all totally randomized now. Nick, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I. I mean, there's not a lot that can be said. I. You really should go back and use. I did it as prep work for the show because they're they're solid, in depth reviews and looks at this book and what it's what's been accomplished. I we we decided to talk about this. I I guess I asked the question, you know, how far back should someone go to really catch up to Justice League 39? And there were some good answers, but I, I think really the only answer is you have to go back to the beginning. Um, this is a, an issue that really does, it encapsulates not only just everything that's happened in Justice League 1 through 39, it, it goes back even farther. And yeah, this is Snyder, I think, doing what Snyder does best right now in telling this, I don't want to say complicated, but intricate, multi-layered story that just has a lot going on. Um, by the time you get to the to the actual war where there's this vote happening, I mean, you've got an extended over you know ten plus issues that leads up to that, that culminates into this ending that's not really an ending. So, yeah, while it is ballsy, you know, there's a lot of buildup. I went back to issue 26 just to to get a frame of context for this. And, you know, we go back and we read all of this and, and you get into the first page of Justice League 39 and it's shooting you back to Justice League number one or number seven. And then a few pages more, it goes back even further to Justice League number one. Uh, this is something that I can see uh, Snyder, you know, in his office with a quite a complicated chalkboard of events that he's been working on at DC and a lot of different lines being drawn between them. And as a reader, does it translate as well? That's, I think that's the heart of the story. And that's, that's ultimately what the discussion is about because it has substance and depth and it has all of these things in real world relevance. The vote is such a trigger word it's hard not to just immediately let your imagination go crazy when Batman drops that. And that's, you know, when we lose the vote, I, I think that that sets up kind of the whole point of the story and that, that drives home. It was almost a bit too on the nose, you know, while it was the enlightening moment, when you look back, you're like, ah, oh, <laughs> you know, that's Scott Snyder going, you know, he's pointing the finger at you pretty much. And that's <laughs> like telling the story. So it, you have to take the good and the bad with Snyder in this. I've always changed his problem and run because what they do works so well with Batman and that character. This is that on a whole other level. You know, there's such a magnificent force and such a large cast of characters that Snyder really has to take it up a notch. And dare I say it gets a bit too lengthy and a bit too to a uh, complex ending you're like you know you're you are almost searching for another page because it, it's not quite as fulfilled as you'd like it to be that being said dc is absolutely pushing this narrative that everything is one that everything that they've done all the stories you've ever read is all part of this functioning universe or multiverse or whatever they've got going on metaverse they they have They've done this time and time again now. That, I mean, a, across different mediums even. And that's what they're telling their fans and the readers and the audience that <clears throat> everything that you've been exposed to at DC Comics is all working in part of this one this one connected universe that we're telling. Maybe it's time for... Some, they've hit that really, really, really hard. And I love the ending of the gateway of actually entering it and into you know, this this concept of everything 
you know, connected. We're not just going to keep driving home the point that that's what it is. You know, now it's time to venture into that and let's let's explore it more uh, hands on. And I think in order to get to something that magnificent, yeah, you need something that holds weight. And whenever you look at Snyder's run and what culminates to it, that's what you get to dig into. So it feels worthwhile from that perspective. And crazy storytelling, like you said, it's it's ballsy and he took a lot of risk with it. So it's hard not to appreciate, but you know, because it's a reading experience. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I was thinking we were talking, right? I'm, I'm sorry, the to kind of hijack here a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, no uh, one of the things that was stressed early on in the Justice Doom War specifically was this sense of legacy that the House of DC is built on. And anybody that's ever talked comics with me knows how near and dear legacy is to my heart. Um, and it's almost like he took that idea and tried to promote that idea and it didn't quite work out the way that we wanted it to. And that's almost like, that's a pretty good analogy for what's been going on with DC post new 52, like post flashpoint, they tried something new. It didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to. They went into rebirth. Rebirth didn't work out quite the way they wanted it to. And it feels like this upcoming potential, like 5g idea that they've built towards and unifying everything into one cohesive narrative like that that to me feels like what this is trying to set up and hopefully that's the one that works like you're right they are beating that drum over and over and over again um and i'm I'm rooting for i really am rooting for them because dc dc is where you know at the end of the day that's where i hang my hat um yeah, I've been reading DC comics since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And these are the characters that I have loved for 30 plus years for the most part. <clears throat> I'm rooting for them. I hope that they, I think that the and the ultimate goal is to say that it is all one cohesive whole. I mean, I don't know how many stories you guys have read of like editors in the 70s and 80s. But like these dudes used to you know, people would come to DeFalco and say, you know, okay, well, I want a Dr. Doom in my uh, Spider-Man comic this month. And DeFalco would be like, let me look, let me look, hang on. No, because this same month he's going to be in Avengers. So you can't use him in Spider-Man because he's already over here. It doesn't make any sense. Right, right. Hoping that we get back to that kind of, that kind of notion of continuity is Shazam infected? Is Shazam not infected? Because we got what? both right now in current right. continuity. <laughs> so that's that's my ultimate hope for how this all plays out. And I think Snyder has that same kind of feel. So we'll we'll see how it goes. Sorry, I just have so many thoughts in yeah, the head. No word. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you didn't bring me on board for your very books. much. So, uh, yeah, Mike, boy. what do you think? What did you think about um, for for me this was kind of and like I said you know prior to the show you know Snyder for me is like the Stanley Kubrick of um, comics right like this read like eyes wide shut um, and for all you watchers out there if you never um, as someone that celebrates Kubrick's uh, library if you never watched eyes wide shut this is what justice league 39 is his eyes wide shut right we, we we've been here before because we've seen you know superman fight another superman on another earth right like dun 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 you know and and batman being negative because he knows that they're not gonna win so he's kind of like the realist and going can we just go and grab a sandwich and just go back home right dun 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 and Diana is kind of like, well, no, let's, let's keep hope and let's keep fighting, by the way, which is one of the traits that I love about Wonder Woman. But we've been here before. But this, it, I don't know. It, it was one of the, this is one of those issues where it was kind of like, it, and to kind of really just ride on the coattails of Nick and Cody, it was, 
it was like a big roller coaster of just up ups and downs like you were like oh this is great but i have questions you know and it was like oh this is great but i have questions like it was great seeing the jsa and you know justice league alpha and stuff but when you got to the end you're sitting here going so they're just going to go through the portal like 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 really were they were did, like that that's it that's 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 what we get like we we know they you know they don't succeed but oh wait we're going to give you guys a redo go through the magic door and we'll just kind of sort it out for the next creative team but i mean i don't know i think for dc like for me in dc this whole like we 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 just got through doomsday clock with the resetting and stuff and i i get that i really really do but this reads just kind of like a mini reset like are we trying to catch up the justice league to everything else and because for me and and i'm on and off again in the justice league so maybe this comment it, I, I don't know it could be kind of empty but it, it almost seems like the justice league is almost on their own timeline like the justice league was never really in sync with what dc was doing it, you know and, and like i said and and that could be a completely you know baseless comment but it just for me it always felt like the justice league was always trying to kind of you know catch up with everything especially with you know doomsday and you know clark kind of like oh hey i'm superman by the way and it, i i really respect what dc is trying to do but at the same time i really need dc to kind of settle on something like we did the rebirth we did we did 52 we did all the stuff as cody just got done saying and it's one of those things like well okay well what are you doing with justice league you know and and this is not a dive this is not a dive on snyder obviously because he is one of the greats obviously but it i don't know at times this was just like what are we doing you know and i found myself kind of going back and i did go back probably i think all the way through issue 20 just to try to kind of get an idea um but really this this whole series just kind of read weird it read odd you know, and it just, it, it didn't sit right. Now, maybe I'm not well versed as I thought I was in Justice League, but like I said, he, he, it has a Kubrick feel, which in, in my terms is a compliment. I do not mean that in a bad way. Absolutely not. But it was just one of those things where it was just like a roller coaster where it was like, it was good. It's eh. I got questions, but it's not bad. You know, um, it's definitely not a bad book, but it was just it, just so much kind of going on. Um, and as and I'm not going to go on the oh, political stance because Cody pretty much covered everything. Um, but I was kind of I don't know I, on the political thing. I was just kind of like, OK, I get what you're doing. God, I'm really tired of reeling about political stuff, you know, and I'm just kind of like, OK, I get it. But OK, you know, on the nose. but um yeah it was a, a good book um it's it's a dc thing you know we've seen this story before like i said we've seen superman fight a different superman we've seen batman be negative about the whole thing and wonder woman's bringing the team together and oh surprise earth 57 justice league is here to help you out type deal um but yeah it was good it was okay um it, it's a dc book um and I, I really hope that they kind of get their identity. Maybe that's the word. Maybe that's not the word that I'm looking for. But hopefully they kind of just um, get their footing. Maybe footing is a better word that I'm looking for. And just kind of um, just get a direction. And, you know, we just got done with Doomsday Clock. Are we really going to start messing with – different earths and different teams and you know oh hey you guys you know failed but we're gonna give you a redo go through this door and it, it'll be fine you know and it's like well so, what's gonna happen in justice league 40. so let me let me let me pose this question to you yeah Mike, because yeah. you made a good point mm -hmm. 
with, you know, we've seen this, we've seen that. Let me ask you this though. How many times have we seen a big crisis level event like this, DC, Marvel, wherever, where right. the end really and truly is the good guys lost and that's yeah. it, you know? Like Cody yeah, was no, I, ballsy as hell. Yeah, I mean, and, and that was, and that's one of the things that I, I, I enjoyed this book, but I thought that that's what the cool thing is, is like, they lost. Like, yeah. the Earth sided with doom. I mean, that's, that's pretty, you know, pardon my, you know, earmuffs kids for a home, but that was pretty badass. I mean, that was, you know, you, you don't see that too often, you know, but yeah, that was, that was a cool part. You don't. And I, I, I think that that was really ballsy, not just of Snyder, but uh, for DC's editorial to give him the go ahead to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, it flies so, so much in the face of convention, uh, just of what we as fans have come to expect from co superhero comics. And to me, that, that ending right there, that total out of, not, not out of nowhere, but unexpected ending it just it hits you you know you get to the end of that comic and it's like holy crap not only have the good guys lost but they're completely resigned to it like there's literally no coming back from this they've got to run through this door and i i believe uh to pick up on something you said cody that this this is where doomsday clock and the rest of the dcu you know dovetail and at last um you, like you said, the door was conspicuously blue. Uh, big signal there. And mm -hmm. I, I'm excited to see what Venditti does with this. You know, uh, he's a hell of a talent of, in and of himself. Um, the, Truth. Like, and, but he's also a different kind of talent, a different style than Snyder. So, and he, he's a lot more ball to the wall. I mean, if you didn't read uh, Hal, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, shame on you. It was the best Green Lantern book um, in forever <laughs> since John's, if nothing else, which is funny because Venditti took over after John's, but didn't get off to a stellar start, as Cody and I have discussed. Um, <clears throat> but to get back to this issue... It's interesting, though, that when you, when you get to the end of this and you think back to, you know, all of this and all the adversity the Justice League's been up against and the odds just keep getting more and more and more stacked against them. And uh, then we get to this suddenly, you know, this end does make a kind of sense. It's a downer, no doubt, but there's an inherent logic to it. You know, the, in the real world, the good guys do not always win. Um, we're and li like you said, and without getting on too much of a political soapbox, that's definitely the world we're living in right now. Not just in the United States, but the actual world. <laughs> um, the, the forces of assholery are winning. And, you know, that's terrible. But what a good, what a, what a sly way to comment on that by Snyder without necessarily beating you over the head with it. Um, <clears throat> And th th this run hasn't been perfect. This issue wasn't perfect. But everything has been, now that it's complete, I really look forward to going back to the beginning, at least Justice League number one. Probably, you know, I've, I've reread through Dark Knight's Metal. I reluctantly reread through No Justice. Uh, but I really want to start with number one here that introduced the concept of the totality and read the now and, and see how it all connects. Because this, this issue, or excuse me, this run, it got off to a rocky I, for me anyway, just as a reader, it didn't seem to gel until around halfway through. And by, you know, uh, uh, just before the, um, uh, the sixth dimension story. And, you know, the mm -hmm. more I thought about that, the more it had in common with, uh, and, and Nick, don't hate me, but uh, Snyder's Batman run in that regard, because for me, that run didn't start to gel until halfway through at year zero. Um, you know, my opinion. Uh, and, you know, maybe maybe it's just a Snyder trick. I don't know. Maybe it's just a quirk of his writing, but just an interesting comparison, if nothing else. 
But uh, a lot of fans, little irate that this is the way it ends, uh, that there's less of a lack of closure than they would like, especially as, you know, if you really want to go back to it, this story has been building since Dark Knight's Metal, which was 2017? No. A long time ago. In, in comic years. A long, it long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah. And, it, um, it started before I was writing with Comic Watch. Okay. So, whew, yeah. <laughs> that It was a while ago. So Snyder's had a long-term plan. I do not believe that uh, he didn't take some twists and turns that you know he didn't foresee coming throughout. I mean, few writers don't don't allow that to happen. But uh, I liked this issue a hell of a lot. It 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 delivered, but it didn't deliver in the expected way. And you know that's awesome. That's a true talent right there. So whatever whatever Scott Snyder does do next, he said he's going to focus a lot more on indie work. Um, I'm sure a lot of readers would would love to get some resolution to American Vampire, uh, <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> um, please, what? Well, just please return to American oh. Vampire. Like that that pulled me into Snyder. <laughs> and, like, like, yeah, go back to that. But yeah, and then just, just sort of great. It yeah. is. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, this, check this comic out. Even if you haven't been reading it, read, read a comic where the Justice League doesn't magically save the day. If you take nothing away from this, it's that your heroes have feet of clay too, and even they can fail and come up short. It happens even to the best of us, which of course the Justice League is. Uh, guys, final thoughts. Like four, four issues back. I wrote into my review when the tide of the war against doom started to turn and things started to look up like, well, we know that justice will win and the tide turning this early seems a little bit early. So, I mean, that, that should speak to, like I said, I'm, I'm a 30 plus year comic reader that should speak to just how shocking it is that he went ahead and let him fail. So that's my yeah. final thought. Like I was certain that they were going to win. They didn't win. And on him, he yeah. left it to another writer to figure out what to do next. I mean, I'm sure there's a roadmap. Like Scott Snyder is not just cold walking away from DC or anything like that. But it's like the worst turnover ever. Right. <laughs> I, I don't get the impression that Vendetti's run is going to address this maybe not right um, away like yeah. I, nothing nothing I, from the I, from the previews the the superman or whatever on. <laughs> so yeah we'll see yeah i we'll yeah we'll see uh, but be surprised if we launch into something completely unrelated oh definitely so here we are again uh, yeah. So that is it for our reviews for this week. That means it's time for our third and final segment. What have you been reading? What are you looking forward to? Uh, Mike. Ding, 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 ding. Winner, winner. Um, I don't know if I've ever talked about the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on this show before, but uh, 102 is out, right? Uh, Sophie Campbell's uh, second issue. And maybe you should go out and grab a copy. I don't know. Uh, but no, uh, stuff that I'm looking forward to, um, X-Men Fantastic Four, um, Conan Battle for Serpent Crown is coming out really good. Um, I'm actually interested. I may stick with Justice League um, and, and read 40. Just kind of, it's, I don't know, Justice League for me is kind of like avocados, right? I don't know if I really like them but they taste really good on toast, right? I mean, I'm not really into guacamole, but I enjoy them on toast. So I may check out, you know, I may check out 40. I don't know. Um, but what I've been reading um, since we were talking Wonder Woman, um, little George Perez collected works of Diana. This is really good stuff. Um, definitely worth the check out. Um, pretty big. I know it's a huge Wonder Woman fan. But um, she's definitely one of those that I keep on the side because um, it's a very enjoyable read. Um, Is that what you're telling us? 
she's your side piece. Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> Good, sir. You will not rope me into that conversation um, because, you know, the wife watches the podcast. So I enjoy Wonder Woman for her uh, brilliance, uh, strength, and just being a strong personality for women across the world. That's why I read Wonder Woman comics. Um, good, sir. Um, hey, so. <laughs> you know, it was your turn of phrase, not mine. <laughs> Nick, how about you? What have you been reading? <laughs> Nick? Okay, so yeah, I've actually, I, one of my favorite things uh, is aside from going to the comic store is going down the road to Books A Million because they have a bargain section for trades. And uh, on that, I found Swamp Thing. Um, Ooh. Yeah, not a lot of you hear so much about Alan Moore's Swamp Thing and of, of course Scott Snyder's, but what you don't hear a lot of is Brian K. Vaughn's. And Ooh. I really didn't know what to expect when I grabbed it, but I knew I wanted it. Um, anything that gives me a gothic horror romance, uh, uh, I mean, give it to me. Um, that's <laughs> we're getting a little of the after effects of the romance in this one because it takes place. <clears throat> After uh, Old Swampy has had a kid, and um, Tefe is who we follow in the expansion of her powers, and I'm only a few issues in, and she's just gotten to the green, and the things have already gone pretty wrong. <clears throat> she's killed a kid. Um, she, she's gotten a whole new, more dangerous powers that are probably not, not going to bode well for any in front of her. It, it's, it's setting up an interesting narrative that I think is early Brian K. Vaughn, like Cody had mentioned whenever I had said that I bought it. You, you get that vibe. It, it's not saga level polished, but it's really cool. And it, it has a story to tell that I'm super interested in. But what I'm looking forward to, if the release date is right, DC has a Crimes of Passion comic coming out. That's a, you know, it's a $10 special that has like 10 stories in it. But they have a cover that shows Dick and Barbara pretty much um, holding each other and caressing each other on the cover. And if you're following Batgirl, she's going through some emotional stuff with Jason, who has quite a history with their family. Um, she's just now coming coming on the side of like um, she just kissed Jason pretty much of the one of the last issues. And so now we're in a Jason come Bard. Crimes. Uh, yes, Jason Bard, who yeah, in the uh, uh, Batman Eternal, you know, really messed up Gordon, had a lot to do with that family. Um, she's coming along with that side of her family or that side of her history, and this Crimes of Passion might promise some more drama on on her part. So I'm kind of looking forward to that one, and hopefully it delivers some some good tea. <laughs> well, we all love good tea. <laughs> Cody, what have you been reading? Bud? What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm going to use what Nick said. I'm going to go in opposite order. What I'm looking forward to is actually uh, Stephanie Phillips has a story in Crimes of Passion, and she's also working on a little series for Dark Horse called uh, The Butcher of Paris. And not a lot of people are talking about this book, but this book has been absolute fire. It's a World War II story about a killer during the period where the Nazis occupied France. And this man killed 200 plus Jews in, in Paris during the war. And nobody talks about this. So there was a very public trial after the war. And apparently people were so just overwhelmed with all the horrors that they had seen during World War II that there was a sense of apathy during the trial. Like, what's 200 people? <laughs> like, like that's that's a drop in the book. We just lost 6 million people. So, I mean, she's doing an exceptional job. Uh, Dave Johnson is putting out just absolutely stunning covers on this book. The artwork has been absolutely fascinating to kind of dissect as a reviewer. So, I mean, that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Butcher of Paris, number three. If you're not already on this book, uh, do your best. 
I think number one and number two both sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't own a copy of number one. Uh, very fortunate that we get advanced preview copies because I missed out. So uh, I plan on buying it in trade. My wife wants to read it. It's been really top notch. Stephanie Phillips is has all the marks of a rising star in this uh, industry. So keep your eyes open. She's somebody I would absolutely put on your watch list. Uh, as for what I've been reading, keeping on theme here, uh, I've been reading uh, Kazoo Magazine is putting out their first graphic collection through Random House called Noisemakers, 25 Women Who Raised Their Voices and Changed the World. Uh, <clears throat> they got 25 different cartoonists to put together three to five page stories about influential women in history. Like, you know, you've got Rosa Parks, but you've got a lot of other women that you ne have maybe never have heard of, whether it's planting trees in Africa and changing the ecosystem or uh, the very first full skeleton fossil of a dinosaur that was discovered was discovered by like a 12 year old girl. So like there's all these really inspirational stories and the way they've structured it, it gives you a list of things you might have in common with that person. So, you know, for the shark, uh, the shark whisperer one, it's, you know, I love to go to aquariums. The ocean is my happy space. I'm brave. I'm curious, things like that. If you have buy this book, it comes out February 4th. It is absolutely astounding. I spent a couple of nights reading it to my own daughter at bedtime. And the things that she was picking up on and the things that she was revealing and also like moments where she kind of turned inward and was like, I don't know, I kind of might be brave, but I'm not always brave. So like this notion of, you know, she's five and she's kind of exploring what she knows about herself in the context of what she's learning about these. Women. It's invaluable, absolutely invaluable buy this book, Noisemakers, 25 Women Who Raised Their Voices and Changed the World, uh, comes with my absolute highest recommendation, especially if you're a parent of a young girl. They're targeted for five, but I mean, it is just top notch. The talent on it is out of this world. I mean, they've got uh, the creator of Lumberjanes and New York Times cartoonists. I mean, just everyone, all women cartoonists, Highly, highly, highly recommended. My review of that should be coming out sometime in the next couple of days uh, with a special preview of one of the stories. Guys, peeled for that at www.comic-watch.com and keep your eyes peeled for Noisemakers. Matt. Awesome. Uh, hey, as, as a uh, father of a young girl, I do believe I'm sold. So uh, cool. I didn't even know this was a thing. So uh, what I've been reading, I have gotten into uh, uh, Gail Simone, All New Adam from uh, 05, 06, right in there. Yes, Cody's got it. Mm. Giving me a so um, this series was amazing. It introduced us to uh, and the rest of the world to Ryan Choi, who is uh, recently on the CW's Crisis, uh, plays by Osric Chow, and I have every reason to believe he's probably going to be joining legends of tomorrow soon this comic is ridiculously fun and mm -hmm. smart and funny and my dumb ass read it out of order <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there, so i got <laughs> grades for five bucks a pop at my lcs and I accidentally grabbed the fourth one to read first, not thinking, not paying attention because it was like the middle of the night. And um, <laughs> oh wow, we're on the Rick Remender stuff. I guess the fourth trade is all about is all Rick Remender. No, you just read it out of order. Um, anyway, classic <laughs> comic. It, it went, went for twenty five issues. It's it's four trades altogether. I I just bought used copies of the first and second volumes for like 350 a pop they're they're super cheap but totally worth your time to find uh can't say enough praise about this series um 
I missed a lot of good stuff at DC that decade, I guess. Um, looking ahead to this week, we've got uh, Martian Manhunter number 12 from uh, uh, Steve Orlando, Riley Rosmo, and Ivan Placencia. It is the conclusion. You know, I've been a I've been screaming about how awesome this series is from the very start. Cody disagrees with me. Uh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, this is it. This is the big finale. The series has been complete labor of love for the creative team throughout and just an utterly unique vision and has all, all in the world that, to say about um, – identity and feeling comfortable in your own skin and uh, huge, huge metaphors all around for the LGBTQ community. Um, just fantastic original work start to finish. And uh, the creative team deserves all the plaudits in the world. So uh, yeah, that is it from, for me this week. And I think that's it for our show. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to the end of yet another episode. We did run a little long this week. It happens. No big deal. Um, you got you got to see me badly play air guitar, and uh, you know it was a great time. We had our we had our founding father here, Cody White. Thank you so much for stopping in. Anytime you want to drop by, Cody, please do. Uh, Mike, Nick, thank you again. Much appreciated. And um, that is it from us for the till next week. This has been episode sixty four of the Comic Watcher Show. Comic Watcher Show is a part of comic-watch.com. Fandom news and reviews written by fans for fans. Thank you so much. Bye.